It's a pleasure to introduce the second panel of today. And the second panel really is all about models and representations. We had this in the discussions also a lot in, in the, for, for the first panels about models. And I think robotics really has a special role for, for models. One could, one could argue that most sciences, most natural sciences, engineering sciences, social sciences, and so forth, are actually building models. But what I think what's great about robotics is that our robots can actually build their models themselves. And, that, and, and then we can uh, invent algorithms that utilize these, these models. So it, it's a great pleasure to have Igor Moric. And Igor is a research scientist at Google Brain. And before that, he was at OpenAI after postdoc at Berkeley. And he received his PhD from the University of Washington under supervision of Imo Todorov. And I think Igor is really the perfect fit for this kind of workshop because I, um, his research covered a large range, range of topics ranging from model-based opti uh, trajectory optimization to create these really cool, interesting climbing, walking, standing up behaviors with a method called contact invariant optimization. And nowadays shifted more towards model-based um, reinforcement learning. And therefore, I think it's a really good fit to this workshop and we are really looking forward to hear your insights. Hmm, thank you. Thank you so much for that, for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I will just, uh, I think this is, gonna, these are going to be pretty informal opening views um, to, uh, but what I think might be something that is provocative, um, or at least it is to me as somebody who has worked a lot in model-based control and trajectory optimization. And this was inspired by um, a series of recent papers that we've done with colleagues at UC Berkeley and Facebook Research and Google. Um, so I will be talking about basically trying to reduce decision making, say uh, reinforcement learning, trajectory optimization, however you interpret that, uh, to a sequence modeling problem. And um, I guess the the motivation is that typically, you know, this this uh, workshop is about uh, models um, and we currently are you know typically discussing learning models of say the next observation or latent state or first state uh, and then combining that with some optimization processes or some learning processes to get you know um, good uh, good behaviors or good series of actions that's typically model plus optimizer uh, it has uh, is our recipe um, but why not just model the next action uh, or behavior as well. Like, is that is that not part of what we consider consider uh, a model of the world? So, um, why um, aren't we more seriously considering uh, contextual models of behavior? So, basically, for example, modeling your current action or maybe a series of actions conditioned on past context. Um, whatever that might mean, maybe series of states, series of past actions, um, and conditioned on a desired future, uh, desired outcome, uh, however you may interpret that. Um, and so uh, we've actually tried to um, kind of like, um, instantiate this, this idea in, the, in real experiments recently with this, this work on what we call decision transformers. Um, which basically takes sequences of uh, returns to go states and actions uh, and uses medium to maybe large scale causal uh, transformer models that are typically used for, for language models like GPT or BERT uh, to predict uh, sequences, sequences of actions. So uh, really, really straightforward, um, really just a, a simple, simple approach and the goal I think um, and I think like the, the, the beauty of this is that um, there is a hope uh, here of making a problem reduction from reinforcement learning to sequence modeling because uh, a lot of investment, a lot of research talent, a lot of infrastructure and in compute has gone into um, improving and training and building these large scale sequence models. And so I think um, as a as a robotics community, um, it's worth uh, it's worth for us to look at that and also ask, well, how can um, how can we get some return on that investment that uh, that is happening here? 
So that was the motivation. And, and again, by large scale sequence models, I mean these examples like we've recently seen, say GPT, uh, BERT, T5, Dolly, or uh, recent new OpenAI uh, work on uh, Copilot and Codex. Um, and of course, um, again, this is this is perhaps an overly cavalier view. Um, and again, to me at least, it's it feels provocative. Um, but it is worth asking: How far can uh, can that take us, uh, really? And the the, the, the typical question that um, I think usually gets asked as a follow up is: Well, where does the data uh, to come these these uh, models? Um, to train these models come from? Um, and I think the, the response is, um, at least on my end, is, well, well, humans don't necessarily learn in the vacuum, um, and neither do robots in practice. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of, uh, I'd say, scaffolding that, uh, that, that we're creating along the way. Like we typically, especially on real robots, we deploy a number of, say, hand-designed controllers, potentially use some, uh, try to use, train some train some policies, gather data, and deploy, deploy and gather data for those. So we have a lot of intermediate artifacts uh, in, in practice throughout our, uh, our robotics research. And I think these large models uh, just uh, trained to do contextual imitation uh, can be a good foundation under which to integrate a lot of those, uh, a lot of those artifacts potentially via, via, via distillation. Um, so, this is the view. Um, and so what are some of the implications this, this has for, for the questions that, uh, that have been posed on this panel? Um, so I think like one of the, the, one of the questions on the list um, that was on the, on the website is, uh, are models needed for generalization? Um, and so I think the consequences of the past view is, uh, well, you likely need model-based um, optimization research to produce true innovation, um, likely. Uh, at least that's that's my view for, for now. But I think a lot of what, what we think um, or we consider as out of distribution generalization, I think still likely could be captured by, by model-free habits. I think especially a lot of uh, combinatorial generalization. We were, we've already seen examples, say, with images uh, that, that it could be done model-free potentially. So, you know, if we wanted to generate an image like of a snail in the shape of a harp or like a red square or a blue ball or, or something, uh, we can do this type of combinatorial generalization, at least, uh, at least in the space of images with these models. So uh, potentially we can do that in the space of behaviors as well. Uh, and um, that potentially can go a long way uh, um, towards actually making um, robots useful and, gener and, and autonomous um, without them necessarily needing to produce something that is truly innovative um, by whatever that means um, to, to, to each um, of you individually. Um, I think another question is um, models and representation. What was the right representation um, that, that we should be thinking about? Well, um, I think um, my view on this is models are lenses to, through which to view the world. Um, and there might be, there may be many, uh, many lenses um, and, and many needs to focus on different aspects of the world. Um, actually, sorry, how am I doing on time? I just want to make sure how much. Uh, yeah, two more minutes, roundabout. Two minutes, okay. Okay, yeah, so um, um, I think, um, you know, typically uh, another example that gets brought, brought up is that, well, um, when we're kind of like doing modeling in perceptual space, we don't want to model every grain of wood. Um, and then we work on objectives that, that try to make sure that that doesn't happen. But, you know, or a robot that is tasked with sanding or cleaning the world does need to pay attention to that. Um, so, and, you know, you might uh, have um, a robot that, uh, that might do this and then many other tasks uh, throughout its day. Um, so I'd say multiple lenses are, um, are necessary and attention is a crucial part of model building, um, which I do think connects, and this is a tool and machinery uh, that these large scale models, uh, language, uh, at least large scale sequence models these days, those architectures uh, can, uh, can offer us. 
Um, I think one question I would um, personally and I'm unsure about and curious about it is uh, discreteness um, and can discrete uh, words or at least the space uh, of um, the language space be a useful universal representation of thought and um, an internal planning, not just uh, not just something that's that's external. Um, and we've had some experiments that that seem to be say seem to be confirming that large language models can actually be fine tuned to other modalities such as images, uh, various bit strings, or even uh, protein sequences um, without actually changing the internals of the model. So there's like potentially internally there's some uh, more universal computation. Uh, of just uh, abstract tokens that is that is happening in these models, and so I'm um, really curious as to what the implications for for robot control uh, here are. Um, so I think um, just to very quickly conclude, I'm not necessarily advocating for for introduction of any new algorithms, but um, more of a problem reduction and trying to actually reduce the space of algorithms that uh, we as a community. Um, are working on, and so potentially that, that so that we can build um, on um, you know on, on the work that is happening perhaps under um, under this large sequence modeling umbrella, um, which may allow us to uh, pragmatically make make more progress and interact with, with other uh, with other communities. So these are my opening uh, views. Thank you so much. That was really great. And I, I hope to see a lively discussion. About that. Then we would go on to Michael. Maybe you can start sharing your screen. Michael is an assistant professor leading the Dynamic Autonomy and Intelligence Robots Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD from MIT under the supervision of Russ Tedrick. And his work focuses on algorithms to generate movements for robots to operate dynamically and safely when interacting with complex environments. And this interaction with, uh, between the robot and the environment is really um, core here. And therefore he made significant contributions in the way contacts and impacts both for locomotion and manipulation can be treated. And therefore I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on models. Maybe also we get some about contacts if I already see non-differentiable. Thank you very much, Tenny, for the introduction. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, assuming everyone, everyone can hear me now. Um, okay, so so we asked to sort of be productive um, if possible, and I'm not sure how controversial these are going to be, but I'll I'll try. Uh, so so first, I, you know, this kind of builds off some of the discussion that was happening in the first first session. You know, I would say we we do need models for generalization uh, if I want to be able to adapt to uh, a wide variety of tasks, potentially swapping in sensors in and out, potentially swapping you know robot components in and out. Uh, but I would also argue that that good models are somehow test dependent, and I think this came up uh, in our in our previous session as well. Uh, and then the second point I would say, you know, this is uh, alluding to what Danny just mentioned. Um, I would say that that you know, at our core, we all kind of understand that most algorithms. I know you know, genetic algorithms came up earlier, but most algorithms require differentiability on some level. So the standard approach lately has seemed to be to change to simulator. Okay, so context not differentiable, so let's change to simulator, make it differentiable. Uh, but I'll argue a little bit today that, that we should probably just change the algorithm instead uh, in a way that uh, doesn't require changing physics. Uh, so, so first to the, to the first topic here, um, you know, I came from, from locomotion originally, so this is going to be motivated by robot walking. But if I want to think about getting my robot to work in real time, I have all these different degrees of freedom. Uh, even if I have this beautiful model, um, you know, it has 24 degrees of freedom, it has actuators, springs, and so on. And, and I simply, you know, at the moment, can't really plan for this thing real time. So what do we do? We map it back to some lower dimensional embedding. Maybe we say it's an inverted pendulum, a very common idea in, in like a locomotion. And this kind of leads to this sort of, I would say, you know, pretty dominant framework right now in locomotion in particular, which is I'm going to do some real time planning on my simple model. Uh, I'm then going to, you know, execute some kind of real time controller, maybe an operational space controller to get it to work in real time. Uh, maybe some sort of QP over here, uh, and then I'm going to run this in the real robot. And so what what we've sort of been asking, and, and this fits within the theme of uh, uh, theme of the workshop, is well, you know, where do these models come from, right? If not our intuition, and can we find them optimally in a sense? So, for instance, can I say, uh, given some you know nice, beautiful, high-dimensional model, my robot, 
And given some set of tasks I might want it to accomplish, let's say walk at different speeds up and down slopes uh, and, and so on, uh, can I offline turn some crank and, and let's say learn or optimize a model itself? Okay, so this is sort of the problem uh, we've posed. Um, it gets a little way, I think, from what Alberto was mentioning, you know, for his sort of uh, high level description of a model. But what we're gonna say is just a, a simple model is some sort of dynamical system, basically that we can map our high dimensional system to. Uh, and we can then pose this, you know, we'll call it optimization, you might call it learning algorithm, where we uh, optimize over the model such that when you force your very complicated robot to act like the simple thing, again, because you can do real-time control of the simple thing, uh, that you achieve low, co low cost over some set of tasks. And then we get this, this bi-level optimization problem here where we uh, embed trajectory optimization in the loop uh, and we have this, bi this bi-level problem where we're sampling tasks solving trajectory optimization and, and so on. Uh, I think this gets a little bit to uh, sort of some of the discussion that, that uh, George was having earlier about the role of uh, differential planners. Here, I think the, the replacement for the differential planner is the trajectory optimization algorithm. You might swap that in for whatever your, your real-time control uh, uh, block is. But I think the high level kind of, you know, let's say problem or, or this way we're thinking about this problem is to say, we're gonna fix some aspect of our control stack, something we're pretty confident in, some kind of, let's say, trajectory optimization or a QP-based control policy, but we're not really sure what that QP or trajectory optimization algorithm should work on, right? It's probably not gonna be the full rigid body system, but it's gonna be something in between. And can we learn or can we optimize that, uh, that model that then goes to our real-time planner? Yeah, so we've done, uh, we've applied this again to locomotion so far, uh, and we can show uh, a pretty good, you know, reduction in cost over uh, a pretty, you know, relatively high dimensional task space, let's say four or five D task space where we're, we're sampling tasks and optimizing. Uh, this is something I think there's a lot of work still to be done here, but, but we're happy, we're happy to, to discuss this sort of general theme in, in the panel. Um, okay, and then, so the other thing about our talk is, is let's think about contact here. So um, suppose we're given a bunch of trajectories that look like this. Okay, so this is a, an SE3 motion. Uh, and I think everyone in the room could sort of look at this and stare at it for long enough and start to get some idea of what's going on here. Uh, there's, uh, I'll play one more time here. There's some trajectory. Uh, it seems to bounce uh, maybe here, right in time. And then uh, maybe bounces again uh, down here. And then maybe it's sliding over here. And, and we're not totally sure what, what exactly is happening, but there definitely was some kind of an impact event, uh, some contact, okay. So let's take a bunch of these trajectories and let's, uh, uh, let's say a couple hundred of these trajectories uh, of the same object going through similar motions, throw them at our, our favorite learning problem where we say, given the current state uh, in SE3, predict the next state. Okay. And what you get is a prediction that looks like something here in green. Okay, so now here, here's what the real data set is actually a cube being thrown here in motion capture. And our, uh, our best attempt at a naive neural network produces this thing in green, which is pretty good. Right, it kind of gets the bulk motion roughly correct, uh, but it, it totally misses the orientation, uh, particularly the final orientation, right? It doesn't actually come to rest on one of its faces. Uh, it penetrates the ground in different places. Uh, and so qualitatively, it's missing, it's missing something. Okay, this is a couple, again, a couple hundred tosses here of data. All right, so what's going on here? Um, first, I, I, would, I would say, let's look at the data itself and, and observe that the data itself has a few interesting properties. One is the velocity is discontinuous in time. Right? We have these impact events. Uh, another interesting fact is actually it comes to rest in finite time. No, you know, this is not like a, an, an asymptotic convergence. This is really cool in friction, stopping it in some finite time. In fact, time that scales linearly roughly in the, in the amount of energy in the system, or velocity. Um, and then also that there's regions of configuration space that you just don't get data in, right? That correspond to penetration, right? This, this cube was never below the table, okay? So if you start predicting it to be below the table, um, you don't have any data there and, and, and all bets are sort of off. And then, so what we did here is we took a simulator now because we could play around with the simulation parameters. And we said, let's try to understand at least why this neural network is struggling. Uh, and we'll vary one of those parameters here. We, we took Majoka and we varied stiffness as a single parameter and universally, uh, essentially no matter how you measure that, whether it's difficulty in training, whether it's difficulty in, in memorizing data sets, whether there's generalization error, basically no matter how we measured it, stiff is harder. Okay, and that's not shocking, right? Uh, stiff contact, stiff ODEs, should somehow be harder, but we see very dramatic degradation in performance as we go from, from, from stiff to soft. And, and 
what's going on here, I, I would I would say is that if you look at most of, of learning theory, um, there's some bias uh, towards smoothness. Um, and, and once you stop having smoothness, once your Lipschitz constant goes up, um, you, you start to see this degradation. Okay, so what can we do instead? Uh, well, what you can do instead is start embedding some uh, non-smoothness into your learning process. And, and so in our case, what we said is reverse, we're gonna represent discontinuity by taking some idea of ge geometry and generalizing it. So, so learning, essentially learning geometry via a neural network, uh, not quite that, but, but something very close to that. Uh, and then the second thing we're gonna do is we're actually not gonna ever simulate. Okay, so we're never gonna take our model and we're gonna roll it out. Because if we take out our very stiff or discontinuous model and we roll it out, we get back to our original problem uh, of, uh, of poor behavior or this sort of uh, dependency on stiffness. Uh, instead, we're gonna pose a bi-level optimization problem in this case, a bi-level convex optimization problem to compute our loss. Uh, and this gives us a really nice way, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but this is a really nice way of saying, if I have a model, how does that model explain my data when my data includes things like bouncing and sliding? And the net result of this is you know, much more natural like predictive motion. Uh, and we can quantify this over limited data sets. I would, I would sort of really focus here on, on low data regimes where you know, our, our models here are in blue and purple. Um, you know, 10 to 12 tosses, we can you know, really accurately, almost as accurately as a, uh, as a ground truth quote unquote model predict the outcome of this, this cube tossing data. And, you know, I think the, the moral here is if you're using a differential simulator, and this is where I'll make, go back to my, my, my sort of controversial point. If you're using a differential simulator to say train for something like send the wheel or uh, as a, an integral part of your training process, you should think very carefully about whether that's appropriate or whether there's biases in that uh, assumption of differentiability that are going to clash in some fundamental way with the real world. Um, and uh, perhaps if the discontinuity, let's say, if stick slip friction is important to you, or if high speed, uh, con you know, making a break in contact at high speeds is important to you, then maybe you're better off looking for ways to uh, integrate non smoothness into your learning process, right? To, to find uh, uh, learning structures and learning loss functions that are appropriate for. Uh, high Lipschitz or or very dis, you know nearly discontinuous behaviors, um, and uh, and and with that I'd be happy to to chat with Igor or uh, or uh, go on to the panel. Thanks a lot. That was great. Then we enter the Q and A session, and so who wants to go first? Maybe I I, I can kickstart the discussion. So. Um, Igor, I know you, you have worked on this context in invariant optimization. Now, if you see what Michael proposed now of um, incorporating this structure into the, the learning algorithm to actually represent the, um, the discontinuities or, or the stiffness, um, what do you think? And how, how does this relate to um, more model-based RL approaches? Yeah, I uh, no, I I do think I actually likely I think agree with with Michael's second controversial point that okay rather than trying to shoehorn the models to be easy to optimize with uh, the tools that we have, um, I think I'm, I'm not I'm probably imagining the truth might be somewhere or you know the, like, maybe successful approaches can be somewhere in the middle where there's a compromise between both. Um, but I do definitely agree that uh, optimization or, or search that can deal with these uh, in these non-smooth uh, situations uh, can be a good approach. I think that uh, th there's also, I think that the devil's in the details and then the question is how do you achieve that? Um, and I think, um, you know, perhaps there might be other approaches than, than from what Michael was proposing. Um, for example, like, is there potentially, uh, say, uh, sampling plus amortization? Could that potentially be a viable path uh, in addition to that or, 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 or no? Just to respond, I, I would say, you know, I'm obviously partially advocating for what we've done, but, but more generally advocating for this, you know, the statement that, I think you, you want to find a way to make the, the biases that you're building into the learning process work for you rather than work against you, which I think they do if your data, if your thing you're trying to fit is, is high Lipschitz, then, then they are gonna fight you 
right? Unless unless you're 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 smart about it. And so that I think that's sort of the general statement. Um, but but as to what approaches might work, I think you know you know Eager makes good points as well. So um, from from a behavioral perspective, so let's say we have this uh, we have this model um, which has um, all the correct biases in it. Do we see then um, the the behavior it creates when plugged into an optimization algorithm? Does this carry over in some sense, or if we go to the the policy level and and would directly tra um, train a policy that um, operates on on these systems that have this uh, high stiffness or high, high lift, um, do the, do these policies know need to know these underlying structures, or is this then suddenly gone? gone? I, I would say then you're, you're probably back to, and this kind of maybe goes to what Alberto was talking about before, you know, it depends on what you want to accomplish, right? And, and um, you know, if you, let's say you're pushing an object around and, and you're content with my hand is always going to be touching the object and I'm just pushing it back and forth and I'm never going into sliding regimes, then you can probably more or less ignore the discontinuity that are going to arise, right? But once you start thinking about Okay, my, I'm going to do hand manipulation, and I need to pick my fingers up from one side to the other. I'm going to put, intentionally go through sliding and, and go back to sticking because I need to reposition my fingers. Then I think you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you know George said this well as well. You're, you're definitely making a trade-off here between how much data you need for whether it's RL or planning algorithm, and and how much uh, structure you're building in. Um, so you know, I, I know that's a little bit of an evasive answer, but but I think. Uh, it sort of depends, but if you want to get away with limited data, you probably need to incorporate that structure into your, your planner as well. Nick is raising a hand. Yeah, I, so I've got a slightly different question. Maybe it's related. Uh, so Igor, I, you know, I, the, the uh, statement and observation you made is how RL can be framed as a sequence prediction problem is super interesting. You know, I think a couple of people have made that, but I really liked how you framed it. It made me emphasize for me a point which had never occurred to me before, which is that it's one of the ways in which I think robot learning is very different to how a lot of machine learning is framing RL. Is that it's I can certainly believe that a lot of our applications, be they like you know elevator scheduling or packet switching, could be framed as a sequence prediction problem. I'm I'm going to pause it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts that robot learning specifically cannot be posed as a sequence prediction problem that you could use in GPT-3 or BERT, et cetera, on it. Because the, the, the way that the data is distributed in the real world, it just violates a lot of the assumptions of sequence prediction. And I think the more that we think about RL for robots as sequence prediction, the more we are building a ladder to the moon. And we're never going to get out of the, the, the state that we're in right now. And I don't know if you, you agree with that or disagree with that or what your thought is. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, I would actually love to know, like, why you think that it wouldn't, or that the that the data doesn't uh, the data doesn't match what you would be expecting robots to do. I think, like, one one saving, um, and if if I'm maybe if I were to venture to guess as to what you're saying, I think like one saving grace potentially is abundant amounts of passive experience uh, that these models might have access to. So you might be able to train on a passive video that's not necessarily uh, you know, annotated with actions or, or rewards. Um, I'm wondering, does that, does that change? Or yeah, I, I'm kind yeah, of no, that's, that's, a, that's a great example. I would hypothesize that that's exactly not going to work because the agent doesn't have agency that's a weird sentence, but you know, the agent isn't actually taking the actions and causes. There's no, it is no way of knowing what actions to take to make the changes happen in the passive video. I think that robot learning does require that interaction with the environment in a way that that specifically wouldn't work. That's a hypothesis that that's a hypothesis, not a, a categorical statement. Yeah, I think maybe what I'm, how I'm perceiving learning, and to me this is this might be different, is is acting like learning is something that I see happening in hindsight, and so you've done your kind of, you, you maybe have done your behavior, maybe guided by some hypotheses, but then you know like something happened, and you're annotating and forming connections as to what's my model of you know, the world or my, my behavior now in hindsight of what happened. And this is kind of like exactly what we might be uh, saying is we're 
we've rolled out the robot behavior. Uh, we've either automatically then annotated with reward, like this was a bad action towards this reward, this was a good one. Potentially that can also be done by humans as well. Um, and, uh, and now we're updating kind of like uh, our model as to what a good, good behavior in this context would be um, in hindsight. I'll, I guess I'm speaking next, so I'll, I'll, I'll say more things. Uh, but I, I do think that the idea of like just, you know, a sequence of bits that uh, that get labeled with a reward um, is not going to capture the, is, is going to be poorly aligned. It's got the wrong inductive bias for capturing the, you know, some of the requirements that a robot has in, in, in inhabiting the world. But I'll say more in a few minutes. Aviv, we can take a question. I think you are muted. A uh, question to Igor. So I, I'm not sure I understood how, how the sequence modeling works, but my question is why, why do you, we need the whole sequence? Isn't just the goal in our court observation enough? Is it, is it because some, uh, um, some dynamics are easier to represent as a full sequences than in single state transitions, or I mean, potentially I would think that you can just have a you know a goal based value function and you could do the same thing, right? You can learn if your experience uh, showed you that uh, from a particular state and a particular goal there is a good action. Why do you need a whole history preceding it? Yeah, I think uh, there's. There's several motivations for this for us. I mean, one motivation I think is this the straightforward like partial observability is you're dealing with images, like no single image might be uh, accurately describing the scene. And so so that's that's one. I think that's the one that gets commonly brought up. I think the other one is uh, this this notion of also uh, credit assignment. So this is something that we've explored only very little in the work that we've We've published so far, but um, it seems like uh, figuring out if you're wanting your model to also predict what is the what is the good long-term return uh, in my current state uh, towards towards achieving my goal. If you want the model to predict actions and returns, well, uh, for uh, for situations that that uh, where um, return like something um, good might have happened a long long time ago you need that history to to be able to predict uh you know it's like if i grabbed uh if i'm getting if i want to predict getting a good reward to like open the door i need to have remembered that i grabbed the key uh earlier um so you and you know you could potentially play tricks to collapse that but like just conceptually it seems like needing that history at least for credit assignment um uh, is important and uh, but that's not something that I think that we're exploiting as much uh, yet. Thank you. Okay, cool. I think we uh, move on and then the discussion can continue afterwards. So uh, Nick, if you share your screen. Okay, so great. Nick is a professor for aeronautics and a member of CSAIL at MIT. And one of his research topics is to create vehicles that autonomously navigate through complex dynamic environments, which requires planning, control, and more broadly, decision-making and uncertainty. But this is not the only research area. Among many others, he also made very interesting contributions in the field of language grounding for robotics. And this maybe might lead to interesting discussions which were with what Igor has mentioned about language being, could be a, a representation for, um, even robot control or for thought and planning in general. We are very happy that you accepted our invitation and looking forward to your insights. All right, Thank, thanks Danny. Um, I just, I put together a, a couple of slides. It's really less about results than sort of my thinking about why planning and learning are, are so important for, for robots. Um, and so I wanted to actually just try and articulate, first of all, you know, so, uh, a lot of the thoughts that I, I have uh, going to talk about today are, are things that have been said already in the workshop. So one of the advent pros and cons of going a little bit later in the day is, uh, you know, you repeat some of the very good points that people have made uh, previously. But, I, you know, I think there is something special and different about a robot in the physical world, whether it's a simulated physical world or it's a real physical world. There is something different. 
that, that needs to be uh, paid attention to that really does actually articulate or argue, excuse me, for the need for planning while learning about the world. So robot, you know, my, my uh, claim, and we can debate this, is that robot learning is uh, different to uh, a, a lot of other learning. And I think possibly one of the first and most important things is that if you're acting in a physical world or a physical world that imposes constraints, then A, every action you take and every computation you, you execute requires energy. And you could argue, well, energy is just a, a cost like any other, but we don't tend to do a very good job of actually combining or actually respecting the mechanical cost of, of moving the comp combined with the computational cost of thinking about and also going and getting more data. So we, I do think that we need uh, new tools, whether they're models or algorithms that actually allow us to reason about the energy required to act in the world, both in terms of getting data, learning data, learning about the world and then acting in it. And that combines data complexity, computational complexity, mechanical complexity. And we're not very good at combining those three things. The other thing is that when you're acting in the world and you have energy, you expend energy. So as a robot acts in the world, it actually deposits energy in the world in different ways. And, and that's important, not only because you're affecting the world, and that's one of the ways in which I think a passive video watching isn't going to give us necessarily as intelligent robots as we would like. But there's also like a, a really important discontinuity there that, that some people started to think about, but not, I think, enough, which is that you actually have the ability to deposit so much energy in the world, you don't just end yourself, you end that part of the world. So most learning algorithms have no concept of the fact that an action that they can take could terminate all learning. And, and we don't have a good way of building that into our models. We don't have, you know, sometimes we can put in a state and that, that has that sort of very, very high penalty and infinitely high penalty and the robot avoids that. But that's not a very satisfactory and certainly not a very general way. And, and so we do actually need the robot to be deliberate about how it gets more energy and learns about the world, so it gets more data and learns about the world as it, as it goes, goes through the world. So this is an important constraint that I think that we, we don't necessarily capture in our, our current models. Um, a second difference, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think people have already articulated it, is that the physical world is not IID. You know, the vast majority of modern machine learning is, is predicated on the idea that you can generalize from the training set to the test set, but the physical world is non-stationary, so it's certainly not IID. And there's like a, arguably an, an infinite number of latent variables that correlate the data in, in complicated ways that sometimes are worth modeling and sometimes not. And, and our algorithms are, are, are poorly aligned with this particular uh, set of constraints. Um, another problem is that robots live in a world where there's simultaneously not enough data and too much data. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, so I think we, we, as roboticists, we feel acutely the fact that data is very expensive to acquire. You know, we have many of our graduate students, you know, spend, you know, multiple hours or days at a time collecting data in order to get like 400 samples, which is laughably small for some, some algorithms. So it's obviously very expensive and there's not enough data. But at the same time, there's too much data in the sense that we're not leveraging every single bit of information that comes into into our systems you know we uh, we may take a raw image but you know the whether you're actually doing feature extraction or you're putting it through a, um, a convolutional network of some kind a lot of information is being discarded because we simply can't process all of it um, if you think about how much power the brain is using for uh, the visual cortex you know, we're not devoting, you know, we're very sloppy in terms of how we use the energy inside of computation, but we're not actually using all the computation nearly as efficiently as, as, as the brain does. So we know we're throwing information away. So we actually have to be thoughtful about what information we keep and what information we discard. And we also, back to the point about IEDness, we actually have to be careful about going and getting more information. Uh, one that doesn't necessarily come to us through a passive activity. Why do we need that additional information? Well, we need that additional information because if we're a physical agent, we, we know that we're going to be carrying out more than one task in our lifetime. We're going to be moving from environment to environment. And we don't do a very good job of actually generalizing across tasks and environments. And, and presumably we've all had the experience where, you know, our, our learn system worked well on one day and then you came back in and the illumination, next day illumination was slightly different or somebody had moved something in the lab and all of a sudden everything breaks again and you have to collect more data. And so we don't have an explicit notion of robustness to tasks and environments. Um, and so this, this requires us to get this robustness. My contention is, is that we need to be actually gathering data that isn't even necessarily relevant to the task at hand in order to do well on, on future tasks. So that requires us to be thoughtful and to plan to gather more data in expectation of, of uh, future tasks. 
And then another thing that we don't talk nearly enough about is that the morphology of the robot has a huge impact on what can be learned. So uh, Michael just gave a, a beautiful talk about the problems of you know, not being able to differentiate through you know, parts of the dynamics. But imagine that you had, or a lot of the time we have these problems because we're dealing with very stiff, uh, stiff robots. Hard, hard to get stiffer than a single block. But you know, our, our robots, our manufacturing robots tend to be very high precision and as a consequence, very high stiffness. And that brings with it implications in terms of what we can learn and how we learn. And we can't make certain kinds of decisions in gathering more data for fear of being in contact with the environment in some way that's bad, that's gonna deposit lots of energy and break things. Um, and the same thing is true of our sensors. You know, a lot of our robots rely on very high precision. You know, stiff is maybe not the right word, but I would argue that a laser rangefinder is a very stiff sensor in many respects. Um, it works really well in the very narrow conditions that it works, and it doesn't work elsewhere. Whereas a, you know, slightly sloppier sensor uh, that is less precise might actually give us give us more information. So these are these are five ways in which robot learning is different, and, and all of these articulate for decision-making process that actually gathers data that, that in a way that recognizes these limitations. So what do we need? Um, so one thing that I, one contention that I, I feel strongly about uh, is that uh, we need learning techniques that have better inductive biases that, that match the world we live in. And I'm by no means the first person to articulate this. And I came across a, um, a beautiful perspective paper that Leslie wrote last year that I just discovered a few days ago um, that also articulates uh, that the inductive biases in our robot learning architectures are poorly matched to what we actually need uh, out of our robots. And the word representation has been used already several times today, but you know, I, I think we all understand that we need representations that generalize outside the training set. You know, we, that the, this is not just about the IID assumption, but we actually need to generalize um, in, in ways that our existing algorithms and, and representations don't, don't support. Um, we need to generalize new tasks and environments. I think I've already uh, articulated this. And we need representations that explicitly model the energy costs and risks that combine data complexity, mechanical complexity, and computational complexity. And, and I think inductive bias is the right way to think about this because we need a way to preferentially choose some models or hypotheses over others. Like we don't have a good way of, of minimizing overall um, uh, at risk to the vehicle in terms of ending its life, in terms of picking the hypotheses that we might be uh, inferring, et cetera. And then the last uh, thing that I want to say is that we might actually need more than one representation. I think it's a, 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 a false choice to posit classical elementary models or end-to-end -end models. Um, Ingmar Posner at Oxford has argued strongly for a couple of years now that the right way to think about a lot of our robot learning is through dual process theory from uh, um, the uh, Thinking Fast and Slow book. Uh, I, I don't know that I necessarily agree with uh, Ingmar's point that it's the right way to think about it, but I certainly think that we could be doing a better job of, uh, you know, so the idea of a differential simulator, just like a simulator that captures everything in the world, is useful, but it's clearly insufficient because it's unlikely that we're ever going to have a simulator that's fast enough to do the kind of optimization that we want. And we also know the biology doesn't do it that way. The biology has a detailed deliberative uh, in, uh, reasoning framework, but it also has the ability to push a lot of learned policies out of that deliberative uh, reasoning framework into what's called procedural uh, um, learning or what we would recognize a policy or controller that lives in the peripheral nervous system in ways that's removed from the brain. And we don't have robots and we don't have learning algorithms that actually can make that transition from deliberative inference into a, a learned policy uh, uh, seamless. Uh, one of the things that we give up as a result of choosing one or the other of these two modes is we don't have the ability to do anomaly detection in our learning algorithms and actually back off to a slower uh, or perhaps more um, uh, uh, competent uh, 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 inference process when the learning is presented with new data that it doesn't know what, uh, what to do with. So uh, love to hear your thoughts, uh, but I, I do think that there is something fundamentally different about robot learning. And I do think the right way to think about the differences is what inductive biases do we need in order to actually learn better and fold those inductive biases into how we get more data for uh, our systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope this will lead to cool discussions. So our final speaker of the second panel is Amy Chang. Maybe you can share a screen. So Amy Chang is a postdoc at UC Berkeley and a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Amy completed her PhD at McGill University and she received her, um, her bachelor and master from MIT. And with her work on state abstractions, model-based reinforcement learning and representation learning, 
and we just heard that representation learning is the, uh, the word that comes up very often. We are very excited to have Amy for this workshop. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for the very nice introduction and for organizing this workshop. Um, I think it's a really exciting topic. And so uh, today I'll be talking about how we can improve planning with state abstractions. Uh, and I just want to start by asking the question. I think this is often a debate that comes up in, you know, between model free and model based is, is model free learning or is model learning too difficult? Um, I think we can definitely think of examples where uh, of environments where model learning can be much more difficult than just learning a model free policy. And here I just have an example on the left hand side of, of, uh, of pouring water, right? And so we know that modeling these fluid dynamics is incredibly difficult, whereas training a model free policy to pour water from a pitcher into a cup is, is much more simple. Um, so then the, the next question is, okay, so then why model learning over model free? And I and we can think of of and I, I don't know that this is universally true, right? And I think that's something that we can discuss later. But one example where I think it's pretty easy to argue that model learning is better and, and doing planning is better than model free is in block stacking. Um, and so the the naive reinforcement learning approach, model free approach to try and, and learn how to stack blocks. Um, is you know using a universal value function approximators, having some representation of your goal space and training a goal condition policy. The downsides of this are that typically we're in settings where you have sparse reward, you only get a reward for achieving your goal, and we're ignoring goal space structure. And that structure usually looks a lot like the state space, which you're discovering as you get transitions from your environment. Um, and so in this paper from ICML 2018, our approach instead was to learn how to make local transitions in a goal space and plan over transition graph. And so we can show that we can, this allows for zero shot generalization um, to new goals. Um, and so I'm just going to give like a brief overview of how this works. It's going to be very high level, um, but we do assume that we have access to this nice attribute space. So we're doing this from pixel observations, but we are given these relational attributes that we think are more useful for reasoning over. And so as an example, um, in the block stacking environment, uh, these relational attributes is just the blue block is to the left of the red block, which is on top of the green block. Um, and so we just want to learn uh, to detect these attributes attributes from pixel observations. Um, we can now build a graph of reachable attributes and edges between them, and we can now just train a low-level policy that knows how to reach uh, these nearby attributes. And then we can just do graph-based planning um, in order to find a policy that will allow us to move from some starting configuration to some goal configuration of blocks. And we see that if we compare this to uh, model-free methods and, and hierarchical RL methods, that we can achieve much better performance. And, and I think this shouldn't come as much of a surprise. But this work does assume that we have access to these nice attributes. And that's typically not true in a lot of real world settings. So what do we do if you don't have access to attributes? So I think this is where state abstractions and representation learning comes in. Um, and state abstractions have been studied as a way to distinguish relevant from irrelevant information in order to create a more compact representation um, for easier decision-making and planning. And a specific type of state abstraction that I'm gonna talk about here is by simulation. So I, I think that there are coarser types of, of representations, but I think by simulation is just particularly nice because it's very strict. So by simulation is an equivalence relation between states that says two states, SI and SJ, are considered equivalent under this relation if for every action, the reward for these two states are the same. And then the second condition actually just makes this uh, recursive into the future. So the second condition says that um, that my transition distribution for any action into next states under this relation is also the same. And so you can think of this as being really like a, a relation that says, if these two states have the same reward behavior conditioned on any sequence of actions, then we can treat these states the same. And so we use this um, notion to uh, as like a representation learning objective. And so in order to do that, we do need to train a reward model and dynamics model in this latent representation space. But now we can construct this representation space such that the distance between two states in this space corresponds to how similar they are under the previous definition. 
And so we don't do any planning or, or model-based work with this, but we just show that model-free control on top of this representation leads to better robustness because it has uh, learned to ignore irrelevant details. And so I, I think like this captures some of the um, requirements that Nick had mentioned in his talk previously. Um, and, and so I think like one thing that we should be trying to do next is that we should use this model for planning. We have to train this latent model anyway to learn this representation, we should use it for planning. This is one way to construct a representation um, and, and that representation isn't necessarily amenable for planning. So that representation is putting states that have similar behavior close together. Whereas maybe for planning, what we actually want is to put states that are reachable close together. Um, and so in this work on, on Plantevec, which was presented at L4DC uh, in 2020, we show a way to, uh, from rich observations, build a graph from your data. So if you have access to this offline data set of, of uh, and so here we were using StreetLearn, which was a data set created by, um, disseminated from DeepMind that uses StreetView images. Uh, so we can build a graph from these street view images and use Dijkstra's to construct this global metric and learn a latent representation where states, uh, how far away their shortest path is between these state, two states corresponds to a distance in this latent representation space. Uh, I think there are, there are similar other methods out there that use these kinds of graphs over replay buffers. Um, but we show that our method is able to exhibit much better performance and can generalize to unseen combinations of start and goal states. Um, the downside of this is that this doesn't generalize. Um, you have a fixed graph, and so you can really only do this for start states and goal states that you have seen previously in your data, and so there's no extrapolation. Um, and so I, I think these there's all of these different kinds of approaches and, and nice properties of these different approaches that we want to combine together. And I think um, if we can do that, then we can get better generalization um, in terms of the representations that we learn and how we can plan over them. So, so one of the things that I want to discuss later is what properties do we want in a latent representation for planning? What information is needed? What kind of structural properties do we want out of our representation? Um, and I think another important problem stepping a little bit further back is what problems are actually most suited for planning? Because I don't think that uh, for all environments we want to plan. Um, and so that's also a thing that I'm happy to discuss later. Uh, and, and now I'm open to taking any questions. Thank you.